Wow. Hey, Peter. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well, man. How about yourself? Uh, doing okay. Stressful two weeks. <laughs> yeah, definitely for all of us. Eh? I, I just so incredibly happy that uh, you folks didn't have to face a, a strike. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, for us too, let's be real. It sucks all around. So it's, uh, it's, it's great for all of us. Hey, Kate. How's your group going, Peter, in terms of your, uh, your group project? So for our group project, we are actually going to have a Zoom meeting after class today. Good stuff. And figure out some, uh, figure out what we're going to do and go on from there. That's great to hear. So yeah, you were able to make make contact. That's important. Yes. And and Kate, how about you? Still not hearing anything back from your folks? I, it's just. It's frustrating because I was hearing back from one person and then he stopped answering and then I heard back from him and he stopped answering and he just keeps ghosting me. So I'm not sure oh, yeah. if he's really, I don't know. I literally have no idea. <laughs> so I'll try yeah. again, but. Yeah, I know it's, it yeah. can be frustrating. Hey, Michael. Um, yeah. Hey, so w what I was going to say and, and, um, you know, this is just advice that everyone should hear, Kate. So I'll, I'll, if it's okay, I'll just give it to you again right here, sort of over the call is that um, if you do, in fact, need to just sort of move forward on your own, <clears throat> you just want to make sure you send that last email to everyone being like, okay, folks, <laughs> like this is the, this is the official warning that it's been X amount of times I've tried to get back in touch and or you know try to get in touch with everyone and if i don't hear back by and you just set it set a date right if i don't hear back by x date then i'm just gonna you know complete it on my own right and so then that just kind of covers that covers you and um kind of everyone involved right because then it's just really clear hey patricia, hey, patricia. um so yeah it's unfortunate i mean uh, you know I'd like to say that never happens in group work, but I would be the world's biggest liar if I said that. Um, clearly, it does sometimes, and that's that's really it's difficult. But you won't get penalized, so don't worry about that, right? Just just sort of send that final communication, and then hopefully that'll jog some people. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, Mike, Patricia, Sarah, if if you have any questions about the group presentation or the um, the essay or whatnot that you want to ask, just go for it. I, I missed the beginning, but was Kate saying she was the only one in her group? She's having a hard time hearing back from the other people. Uh, I was just wondering because if we had somebody in our group that was um, not around, could like could she just a full group that you know that is maybe a little more involved, or is it you get what you get? Yeah, the only trick with that is, um, Patricia, we were just sort of saying, I, I was saying that, you know, Kate's got to sort of send a final message and she, there's been sporadic contact with one student. So it just gets, it gets a little tricky that way. So if, if, um, if she jumped ship at this point, you know, um, then that other student who did get back in touch could be like, hey, wait, well, you know, what about me? That, so it's just, it's one of those unfortunate situations. Um, yeah, nice of you to offer though. Some good solidarity there. Can I ask her another question about the, uh, so when I was look, going over the project, my question was um, about citing. Yeah. Um, or I call it like purgatory, not plagiarism, because you go to purgatory <laughs> if you decide, if you decide to plagiarize. So, so I don't want to go to purgatory. So my thing yeah. was when I was doing the project, do I have to cite um, when I'm doing my slideshow? So if okay. Things yeah, yeah. It, it's a good it's a good question. And there's an easy way to do it, folks. So, so don't like it's not like in an essay where after every line you cite something, you got to have a little citation that that would to me would be ridiculous. What most people do is at the very end of their presentation, just have have a slide. And it can just literally have if it's websites or whatever, that's fine. 
And, and so if you just get everyone who's putting together their little piece, just tell them, listen, save the links, you know, for, for where you got your information. And on the last page, you can just have a sort of citations or something, the last slide and just list them all. And it said about um, you can do a voiceover. I've never done a presentation, so this will be new for me. But okay. it's, you can do a voiceover, or yeah. are we actually presenting it in class? Like, am I? Is the focus going to be on my group, and we're going to each take turns and talk about it? Or like when I do this slide thing, it'll show me how to add my voice and stuff. Yeah, so good question. So we're not, we, we don't have class time to actually do the presentations in class, but you do need to present. So you can't just like upload um, a, a deck of slides, right? Your group has to present it. So there's different ways of doing that. So within PowerPoint or Prezi or Keynote or whatever, you can record uh, audio for, for each slide. And it's not, um, it's not that difficult to do. You know, you should be able to get some, um, uh, some help if you haven't done that before in terms of how to record um, audio, but it's it's pretty straightforward. Another thing that a lot of students do is they just do a Zoom call and they present it and they record it, right? And then you can upload the uh, the MP4 to the um, to the course homepage. So that's that's kind of an easy way to do it too. And then you literally just you know you do it as you normally would if you were doing it in class, but you just record it on your own. Some students, uh, you know, some groups, one of the students will be really good at doing video editing or whatnot, and they'll just edit together a video and, and handle the voiceover. I mean, that's fine too. So there's, there's a few different options that way. I would just say, based on your tech level for your group and what, what you think is easiest, just do that, right? You know, Because what you could do, uh, Patricia, for instance, if you're having everyone kind of do their slides on their own and then you're combining them, you could just sort of say to everyone, do a voiceover for your slides, right? Because you, you do have to be presenting your your information, right? So I hope that helps. No, it does. Sorry, just one more question. I wish sure. I was on a little bit earlier because I think Kate probably asked. Um, if so, if we get down to it and um, say we have three people in total, and we've divvied up the work and at the last day this is not going to happen but just say it did yeah um, the other people in my group didn't participate and there's just me and my slides and my voiceover um <laughs> do i just send that to you what it is that i do have then uh yeah not ideal so uh straight up so and this is where it gets challenging so First of all, I would say don't have your deadline be the due date. So if you're if okay, you're gonna yeah, if you're gonna have everyone combine their stuff, have it be at least the day before, right? And so worst case scenario, then uh, Patricia, if someone doesn't come through, you can do a quick like you know, throw in an extra couple of slides or something like that. I guess just what I'm trying to say is. It, it, then the onus is on the students that are participating to just make sure that it's a coherent presentation, right? So if there's a huge gap or whatnot, I get it. It's not like you can totally redo the other students' work in a day or two, but you just want to make sure that there's some rhyme or reason, right? And that it kind of flows, if that makes sense. Yeah, so in that situation, their name wouldn't go on the report, and I see why Kate is making the face that she's making. I yeah. understand <laughs> yeah and this okay. is you know folks it's one of the funny things about oh well, i mean okay listen when you're doing it it's not funny i get it it's stressful and it's really annoying but this is this is the real world this literally is like i i work in a lot of different capacities for different organizations i'm the executive director of a nonprofit organization i work in groups all the time this is always how group work is right and and it's unfortunate, but it's just it is. It's, this is part of just being being a human being and working with other human beings. You're gonna have people flake on you. You're gonna have people who have different communication styles. Like all that sort of stuff is gonna happen. So, uh, in, on a certain level, that's a lame justification for why we assign group work. But also, just so you know, like, and so sometimes it means like you know Patricia or Kate or whatever. You know, I'm sure a lot of the people on uh, coming to these lectures are the the doers in your groups. And one of the downsides is, yeah, sometimes you're the person at the end being like, ah, oh, damn it, this person didn't come through. 
So you do, you know, you do a little bit of extra to make sure that it comes together. I mean, the upside is you're ensuring that you get a good mark, you know, um, and then, um, you know, and, 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 but yeah, sometimes you're, you're taking on some extra work and that I'm not sure it's fair, but it's certainly life. <laughs> like from my experience, it just is. And I, you know, Patricia, I think you, you know that too, right. From probably your experience working and whatnot. And, you know, it's, it just, fair doesn't it, play it often. yeah, no, it really doesn't. And so at the end of the day, it's more like, okay, listen, do I just want to, you know, take this in hand to a certain extent and make sure that we get this done, you know, that sort of thing. And again, like I said, I, I'm sure, I'm sure most people on this call are those people. So, um, yeah, Saris, did you have a question? Yeah, actually I got your email today and, um, I have some researchers on the Wikipedia about my uh, topic for, uh, for it's about the overshoot and yes. uh, I, I use about, uh, uh, human population because with the, the population is uh, uh, increased and grows. Uh, so uh, the, I use that and I want to know, is it correct for the example of the overshoot? If is it not, I have to, um, to change it. Yeah. So Sarah, what, what I, uh, in my email, I think I directed you to like I, I'm wondering. I got you, em, your email today, but I'm working on it and I finish it. So I, I want to I understand. know. Yeah. Sorry, I yeah. understand, but please let me finish. I'm, I, mm -hmm. I directed you to actually look at the course material. I'm wondering why you wouldn't do that for overshoot because there's so many examples that we go through, right? If you look at the lecture, if you look at the slides that have been uploaded, if you look at the chapter uh in the book like there's so many examples of overshoot so oh okay you don't need to go to wikipedia to find one you know and i mean population growth is is one but also it's not as big as people used to think in the sense that most countries already their their fertility rate is 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 stopped growing in fact in, in almost every country in the world even the big ones like you know china and whatnot yeah so um it, it for sure population is an issue but it's it's maybe not as big as a lot of people think which is why i don't spend as much time on it so there's a lot of stuff we we talk about in, in the course whether it's you know toxic pollution or habitat loss or peak soil or peak water like yeah actually i i i use the, the about the peak soil and the uh, habitats for uh, in the climate changing i use that for that part and uh okay but then then you want to just be careful that you're not so you just need you need three examples and and if if you're if if each one of your examples is huge and includes four different things then that's not going to help you either so if okay. you're gonna, so peak soil is that's one example because i mean okay there, there's, thank there's, you there's, there's a lot there's a lot to that actually because you're then you're talking about industrial agriculture you're talking about using pesticides and chemicals you're talking about monocrops you're talking about oil intensive agriculture like it, just peak soil is as, as one example is there's a lot okay okay I, thank you so much yeah yeah so anyway it's, i'm glad i'm glad you uh that we were able to have the, the conversation because yeah um, yeah i was thinking that it was you were making it harder for yourself than you needed to right so yeah okay thank you no problem at all that's great um avish so you you should email them i that's what i would do uh, through the course canvas page uh you can email your group members and that's that's how you want to start so and uh you know and then if you're having a hard time getting in touch with them avish let me know okay so send me an email and then I will try and get in touch with uh, your group members too. But you should start start that way. That's that's what I would recommend. Super. All right. Well, you know what? It is uh, it is good to be back doing this live again. I really apologize for all the disruption the last couple of weeks. It has been, uh, and I know, intense for all of us, but I'm really glad that we're here and uh, we're not walking around the, the campus and you folks aren't sitting at home. Uh, wondering when you're going to finish up. So that's great. So without further ado, let's get into today's lecture. And today's lecture is a little bit of a mystery in the sense that we're, we're going to ask um, the question of what happens to human communities 
where we know that because last lecture and I know um, it, you know it, it just got up a, a couple of days ago so I know some people haven't seen it but last lecture we were really looking at this idea that early human communities you know were actually very environmentally sustainable very equal very inclusive very cooperative like we have evidence to this um, effect and so if that's how we started then how do we get to um sorry avish you can do it right through the site you just literally you need to go to the course canvas page you need to click on persons you'll find your group and you can email your group members um uh when you're in the uh um oh the inbox feature on your on your canvas page okay why don't you try that and then uh if you're having a hard time send me an email after the class okay super all right but try that try that first you, you might surprise yourself it's fairly straightforward i think so yeah a prehistoric mystery if we involve evolved in these small scale very equal very sustainable societies if these societies didn't destroy their ecosystems and if we lived that way which we did for most of our history about 290,000 years out of our 300,000 year history then then what happened because what what we see is about 10,000 years ago from about 10,000 to 6,000 years all of these changes start occurring in human societies and they only happen in a few societies at first but what started happening is some societies started growing really big so you you start to see the introduction of scale and complexity as issues societies all of a sudden become highly unequal all of a sudden you have people with lots of stuff people with no stuff people who could um uh you know dominate other people which was never the case in our early communities you see warfare, which had never really happened before. You see imperial expansion, groups conquering other groups, enslaving other groups, right? You see the destruction of ecosystems. So, and and then finally, you see what, what we today would call oligarchic societies, where you have a small group of people that dominate the entire group. So this is a big question. How did we get from our, our, our humble, cooperative, equal, sustainable beginnings to these oligarchic societies what happened so that's what we're going to talk about in this lecture and the reason why this is an interesting story is first of all it's just interesting from a historical perspective but what we're going to see is some of the answers to this question of what happened or what went wrong they give us insights into our present day society and on some of the things that we're struggling with right now in terms of the sustainability of our industrial capitalist global civilization. So we're gonna see some of these things carry over into the present. And a lot of what we're gonna talk about is drawn from a field of archeology span called trans-egalitarian studies. So there's a big highfalutin academic word for you. Trans-egalitarian, so trans, think of transitional, right? Egalitarian, this is from the last lecture, egalitarian societies are societies in which everyone is pretty equal, right? In which there's no big distinctions in power or wealth or anything like that. So trans egalitarian, think of the transition from equality to inequality, right? So that's why that's the name of this field of archeological research. And there's a lot of different theories that researchers have put forward based on their evidence, based on you know, the digs they've done and whatnot, in terms of how this transition happened from small scale equal societies to large scale unequal societies. And all these perspectives are useful. So some focus on environmental issues. Some focus on literally physiological issues, aspects of who we are biologically as human beings. Some focus on economic issues, how changes in our forms of economy change our societies, and still others focus on political issues and how these sorts of things led to uh, this transition. And so really, all of these play a role. And so together, if, if you look at all these factors, they start to tell the story of that transition 
from these small scale equal cooperative sustainable societies to the kinds of massive unequal destructive societies that we see now. So we're going to look at a few different things here. We're going to look at original inequality, so basic biological uh, distinctions uh, that we have that could have been the basis for inequality. We're going to look at the role religion plays, the role of aggrandizers. So these are basically, you know, type A alpha male types that want power and glory and whatnot. We're going to look at sedentary living. So that's where we basically decide to stay put in a certain community. Extensive agriculture, where we start growing our own food, growing population, how that affected things conflict and warfare, increasing social complexity, increasing hierarchy, and finally social stratification. So all of these aspects are things that we look at when we're looking at trans egalitarian studies, trying to answer this question of what happened from the small scale to the complex and the unequal. So let's start by looking at this idea of original inequality. So there is a, um, a, a theorist, um, he's no longer with us now, but he was a very um, influential writer. His name was Murray Bookchin. He wrote a book called The Ecology of Freedom, and he was trying to understand the origins of inequality. And what he argued in his book is that actually the seeds of inequality were already present, even when we lived in these small scale, very equal societies, these egalitarian societies. So we said, you know, there was relative equality within these societies between all the adults, but there were some differences between men and women. So he points to the fact that, you know, even if you look at small scale or tribal societies today, there's status differences between men and women, right? And he's like, well, there you go. That's part of those inequalities could have been the basis for further inequalities down the road. He points out too, which makes a lot of sense, there's also age-based inequality. So of course, within tribal societies, adults have more power than children, kind of makes sense. And elders have more power than sort of younger adults. So there is this idea of age level inequality as well. And so what he argues is that the first forms of domination were of men dominating women, the old dominating the young. And basically, he's sort of saying then, as a result, older men were better situated to try to assert control over these cooperative groups, right? And so, and he says that this, this must have happened several times. And in a lot of cases, we were able, we were able to prevent that, right? So in the previous lecture, um, if you're able to go, go back and watch it, um, I mentioned this thing about counter power coalitions, which is basically how small scale societies deal with someone who's like, you know, a type A egotistical jerk who's like, oh, I want to take over the group because I'm awesome and I'm stronger than everyone else, right? Well, when that happens, what tends to happen is a, a bunch of other adults will band together and they'll like take that person down. They'll say, no, you're not going to do this because we're all going to gang up against you. So that's, it's like counter power but it's a coalition, it's a group of people, right? So this would have been a struggle. In a lot of cases, that one person trying to seize control wouldn't have succeeded, right? He would have gotten thrown out of the group or he would have gotten speared in his sleep by the rest of the people in the tribe who were like, this guy's, this guy's an idiot, we're gonna take him out. But in some cases, these older men were able to assert more control. One of the really important tools that were all, that could could be used and that we have evidence that it was used is if someone wants to take control of the group, it helps if they also are part of the religious institution, so the spiritual institutions in that community. So if we look at contemporary tribal societies, hunter gatherer groups, so groups that are living right off the land, you know, they have complex spiritual belief systems. And typically, we call their religious experts a shaman, okay? And this is an example here of an Inuit shaman. This is, these are early pictures that were taken like in the late 1800s, Northern Canada. And so, you know, the shaman is pretty imposing figure, right? Like they, they really are um, 
a powerful figure. They embody spiritual forces. That, that's sort of what people in the group believe. And so, you know, this is what we know from contemporary tribal societies. So it's easy to think that that's the way things would have been like in the first human communities too. Now, normally shamans, from what we can see, they tend to actually embody egalitarian values. And what that means is, in most groups, shamans tend to be the ones who are peacemakers, who are keeping tensions from boiling up, who are encouraging inclusive, democratic, sustainable practices, right? Um, but they are also figures of power. So it's undeniable that a shaman has more status in the group. Why? Because they're literally seen as the people that speak to the gods, right? That's a pretty sweet gig, right? If you're, if you're a shaman. Um, and this gives them a lot of social power and influence. So it's one of these situations, folks, where like if your shaman is uh, community-minded, pure-hearted, good person, they're going to use this power for the benefit of the group, right? To make the group um, more cohesive, more successful, more sustainable, right? However, the more that individuals are given power, um, it can be a problem because they can also use that power for their own selfish interests. And so this is where we get into one of the important concepts from trans egalitarian studies is you, you see the emergence of a new kind of power in human communities. So in the previous lecture, I talk about power with, and that's the power that comes from cooperation. It's one of the reasons why we survived as human beings when we were, you know, back 300,000 years ago, uh, when so many of our other, well, all of our other uh, cousins didn't survive. They all perished, but we survived. And one of the strong theories about that is because we were highly cooperative. You know, we had each other's backs. It's really, really helpful when you're struggling against a harsh environment. If you've got collective shelter building, collective defense, collective food gathering and hunting and child rearing, very, very uh, powerful adaptive strategies, right? So that's power with when can people, people combine their energies together and they can do more things that, that you can. I mean, it's like when you're trying to move, right? Everybody understands power with when you got to move, right? You, you can't just do it all yourself, right? You need friends to come over or you need your parents or you need, you know, family members or whatever. That's power with. Together, you tackle this big project and you get it done. Power too is a different kind of power. It's where then you start saying, well, there's a special task that only certain people can do. So we're going to give them the power to do that task right? And originally, folks, we do this because it's a good thing. It's like, we can't all be shaman. Some of us have to be hunters. Some of us have to be, you know, carvers. Some of us have to be people who are going to build the, the houses and gather the food and stuff. And so if someone's going to be the shaman, well, then they're going to take that on, that role. It's a special role. We're going to give them power for our own benefit. This is, this is how it starts, right? And again, like I said, most people that you give power to, especially in a small group, they do use it for the benefit of the group, right? Because it's in their interest to whatever. So most use it for what we call pro-social ends. However, power to can turn into power over, which means that that person that you give a special role to can start using that additional status prestige and power to start manipulating the group for their own benefit, right? And this is something that we see. Um, and it's easier to keep tabs on someone that you give power to if, you're, if your group is really small, right? So say maybe like you're in a small hunter-gatherer group, right? And there's like, you know, Jane the shaman, and everyone's like, oh, you know, we're going to give her all this power. She's going to lead the rituals. She's going to talk to the gods. She's going to help us make decisions and whatnot. You know, and maybe after a little while, Jane starts being like, well, you know what? I'm the voice of the god, so you do what I say. And people are like, well, that's not cool. If you're in a small group, 
it's easier to be like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Like, A, who do you think you are? B, this is not how it's supposed to go. C, if you keep this up, we're going to bounce you. You won't be the shaman anymore. It'll be someone else, right? So you can control things more easily in a small group. But as groups get bigger, then people that have power too are more easily able to get away with kind of abusing their power, right? And to being more sort of manipulative. And so that's basically what, what starts to happen. And so what you start to see, folks, is that religion becomes a very powerful force in societies becoming more hierarchical, oligarchic, and unequal. Um, so it's a strong factor in all of the first states, the very first states that evolved you know, in different parts of the world. And by states, we mean a society with three levels of political organization. You have a central government, regional governments, and then you have like village level or sort of governments. That's a state level society. And transitioning from your small little hunter gatherer groups to this complex three level political organization, religion plays a huge, huge role. And there's a reason why I have this picture here, because this is a picture of uh, King Louis, uh, I believe it's Louis the 16th, if I'm not mistaken, um, and, of France, and he was known as the Sun King. And, and he, in this picture here, is showing, this is a painting from, from the time, right, in the 1700s, uh, which shows King Louis being blessed by the heavens, right? Because there's this idea among monarchies, kings and queens, that their rule, their power to rule comes from the gods, comes from religion. So we see this marriage of political power and religious power at the dawn of every single complex society. So this means it's pretty important. So, and this is an interesting thing about religion. Right off the bat, we see something here that I think is something we could, we could probably all agree today. Religion starts out as something that generally speaking, or spirituality, generally speaking, is very positive. It helps bind the group together. It helps uh, teach values of cooperation and sustainability and all these good things. So it, it has a very positive potential. But then we also start to see that it has a dark side. It can be a powerful mechanism of control as well. It can be a way of convincing people to do things that you want them to do that are maybe even against their interests. But you say, well, that's what the gods want, which is also what I want. How cool is that? But really, it's just what the gods want, right? And it becomes this really sophisticated and kind of sneaky way of getting people to do what you want them to do. I think we can still see this in a lot of modern day societies, right? Uh, people that cynically use religion in order to, um, you know, assert control over societies or advance political agendas, right? So religion is, plays a big role in this transition. Another one, though, is just the simple fact that you have some individuals in human societies, and most often they tend to be men, but not always, you can get some women that, that fit this, this role too. And researchers call them aggrandizers. A grand, to, to be an aggrandizer means to make yourself big. Um, so we, we, people might have heard the term self-aggrandizement. This is people who are like, oh, I'm so amazing, right? And they wanna sing their praises all the time. Like Donald Trump would be a classic example of a self-aggrandizing person. You just like, you could sometimes call them a narcissist too, right? Like that would be uh, a psychological description for these people. So there's a Canadian anthropologist named Brian Hayden, who's done some really good research on aggrandizers. And I was in correspondence with him when I wrote my book and we've collaborated on, on some things after because um, uh, he really studies this whole phenomena of aggrandizers. And he studies tribal societies on the West coast of Canada. Um, in British Columbia. And what his research has shown is that how leaders in these societies are able to take power that is given to them by the community, but then they're able to twist that power around for their own selfish purposes, right? 
um, they're able to become aggrandizers, to make themselves big and powerful uh, by using the, um, you know, like I said, the kind of um, trust that people place in them. And what's interesting is uh, the, the group C studies on the west coast of Canada, how chiefs do this is through feasting. And it's, it's kind of interesting because what a, what a chief will do in order to become more powerful is they will hold a huge, huge feast and they'll invite everyone around and they'll give stuff away. So at first you might be like, oh, that sounds weird. Like that's a weird way of becoming more powerful by giving a bunch of stuff away. But it's actually quite genius because in the society, there's still, because it's still a small scale cooperative society, the idea is that the chiefs are supposed to serve the whole group. So there's still this cooperative democratic value structure. However, what the chiefs do is the bigger the feast, the more generous they're considered, the higher their status and the more power they get. So they kind of play that and they also establish obligation. So the idea is that, oh yeah, like you come to the, the, the chief's feast, but then you kind of owe the chief a favor. So it turns into this way in which the big chiefs become more and more powerful and start controlling more aspects of the society. And, you know, again, partly how they justify this is because the chiefs are also seen as religious leaders too. So they're able to sort of blend that like, oh, well, I'm, you should, you should listen to me, first of all, because I'm so generous. Remember how well you ate at that feast last month? Well, you know, you should listen to me, but also I'm chosen by the gods, right? And so that's another reason why you should listen to the chief. So here's what the problem is. As soon as you get people who, you got to remember, the group gives them power initially for good reasons, Okay. Oh, you know, you're the person who's going to um, keep our group's spiritual uh, traditions alive. That's a worthwhile task. We're going to give that to you. A chief, you're someone who we trust is wise. You're going to help us make decisions. We'll give you that power. That's power too. But over time, what tends to happen is when someone gets in that role and they're self-interested, they start using their prestige. They, they start using their status in the group in order to start to change the society for their own benefit, right? And so there's, a, there's an important term for this that I want folks to, uh, to know. It's called structuration. And what this is, I mean, it can sound, again, this is like some academic language here, but it's, it's basically how individual behavior can influence the whole society around you. And Researchers call this the interaction between structure and agency. Agency is individual behavior. Structure is the whole society, the kind of institutions, the laws, the government, all that sort of stuff, right? And so what we know is that, you know, structure influences behavior, okay? So case in point, we're all in a college class right now because in our society, the institutions that surround us, economic institutions, educational institutions say, well, if you want a job, this is what you do. So clearly we're influenced, our decisions, we're influenced by the society we live in, that's structure. However, we're not robots, right? So we can choose, we're like, okay, well, I'm gonna take this program or that program. Or maybe we decide, oh, I did a year of college. I don't want to do college. I want to go do something else. I want to travel for a while. I want to. So we also have agency, right? And so really every society is a conversation between the broader society and our own choices as individuals. Here's the difference though. When that one individual is very, very powerful, is very connected, then that one individual can change the entire structure. And a lot of times they can do it, they'll do it slowly. They won't do it really fast. They'll do it over time, but they can make a structure that was once democratic, a society that was once democratic, they can make it less and less democratic over time. Now, folks, we saw a bit of an example of this in the United States under the past president, Donald Trump. 
where you got someone in a position of power who I would say very clearly wasn't a grandizer. He was kind of an egomaniac who felt that he was the most amazing you know, person on the planet, the best, the smartest guy, the best deal maker, you name it. He gets in this position of power and he's, he tried as much as he could to change the whole system. He literally tried to overthrow the whole electoral process, right? He lost an election and was like, no, I didn't and tried everything in his power to change the way that the United States actually runs elections. It was very scary stuff. He almost pulled it off, right? Um, that's an example of what an aggrandizer can do. One person whose agency is so powerful that they can change the whole society, right? And so it's a, it's a big problem that groups need to look out for. So, We've got a few things already, right? We've got religion, we've got these powerful individuals, you know, usually men, but again, it sometimes can be women too, who want to take control, who are sort of egomaniacs, right? They're part of the transition. But another thing too was simply our patterns of living. So approximately 15,000 years ago um, in modern day Turkey, Syria and Palestine, it's an area that we know as the Levant. Um, in this area, groups of human beings were able to settle down and create permanent villages. These groups started out as hunter-gatherers, sort of wandering all around this area, um, gathering food, hunting food. But because wild grains were so plentiful, they were able just to sort of be like, well, we're just going to create a permanent village and just go out and gather from there, right? And we can just keep bringing the stuff back. We can store some food, right? Because there's enough food. So really, these were some of the first communities that just stayed put. Before that, we didn't. We used to wander around all the time. And so the first um, permanent villages were established. Now, over time, people stopped just, or they moved from just gathering wild grain, they started figuring out how to grow their own, right? So these early villages later became the first farming villages. So by about 9,500 years ago, um, in the Levant, we call this the late Natufian period, you start to see wheat being grown, barley, peas, lentils, chickpeas, flax. I mean, folks, these are staples we still of the human diet today, right? So about 10,000 years ago, um, most of our staple crops, we were already growing, right? Um, by about 8,000 years ago in China, they started domesticating and growing rice. And then also you start to see animals being domesticated. About 11,000 years ago, sheep, are domesticated in Mesopotamia, pigs slightly later in Europe and Asia, and cows about 8,500 years before present in Turkey. So plant and animal domestication, what they did is they allowed us to pr pr produce a lot more food, right, more reliably. And this was a game changer, both of these things, folks. So producing our own food and staying put totally changed our way of life because we were able to, if you produce more food, your population is able to grow. If your population grows, you need more land. If you have more land and a big population, you need to grow more food. You grow more food, your population increases, right? So you start to see a positive feedback loop. Um, and this is really what starts to happen to human communities. So again, we're, we're domesticating animals, we're planting crops, we're increasing our food, that enables us to uh, sustain more of a population. As your population grows, you need more land and more food and therefore you expand your territory. So communities start growing, villages start growing, populations start growing. And this is a completely different scenario from before. Remember before we lived in small groups and we moved around all the time. So, Competition over land really wasn't a thing because it's like, oh, okay, if, if a group moved into your area, you could be like, hey, this is our area. And, and they'd usually be like, okay, we're going to go over here. But if they were jerks, you'd be like, okay, screw you. We're going to go over here, right? You could move around. There was flexibility that way. And also human population was so small 
that it wasn't a big deal. There was literally abundance for everyone. But this starts to change. All of a sudden you have farming villages and you have herding communities that have these big herds of sheep or goats or pigs or whatever. And they don't want to move. You invest lots of time and energy. You create buildings and structures. You have fields that you put a lot of work into. You have herds of animals that you put a lot of work into. You don't just want to leave if someone comes into your area. So what this leads to is conflict and warfare. So as farming communities grow in these various areas, available farming land starts to become scarce. And you start to see these farming communities, they're both growing, 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 and they start bumping up against each other, right? And what happens then is, um, this is what's known as political circumscription. Again, I know that's a complex term, but it's basically a limit placed on your society by bumping up against the borders of another society, right? And so we know in the world today, we live in a completely politically circumscribed world. One country's borders ends at another country's border all over the planet today. But that wasn't the case originally. Originally, there were large chunks of the planet that no one group had claimed. And so if you were uh, an early state, say maybe if you're ancient Egypt or ancient Greece or ancient Sumeria, you're able just to keep growing and growing and growing and growing until you bump up against another society. That's what's what political circumscription. Circumscription means to be contained. So if you're politically contained, it means you're, you've grown up against all of the boundaries all around you of other communities, right? Well, what happens when a bunch of expansionist societies bump up against each other? Well, what we started to see is the emergence of conflict, of warfare. Because again, you can't just pick up and move. You've got this whole huge society. You've got all your, your fields and you've got your temples and you've got your roads and all this sort of stuff you've built up. You're not just going to pick up and move away, right? And so land now becomes something that people need to fight to defend. Um, but also some groups would realize, hey, let's just take other people's land. It's easier than you know, cultivating our own, right? Now, we have to be clear, folks, a lot of these um, political circumscription events would have been peacefully resolved. Communities would have been like, okay, all right, your border is gonna be here, our border is gonna be here, that's fine. We're gonna live in peace. We're gonna live within our means, right? That would have happened a lot in the past. And in fact, that's what evidence suggests. Otherwise, there would have been evidence of warfare everywhere at this time, but there, there really isn't, right? It's only in a few instances. Many conflicts would have been peacefully resolved. Um, other communities would have joined forces. They would have simply been like, oh, okay, like this farming village grew and this farming village grew, and they bump up against each other. They're like, hey, let's combine and form a bigger community. That would have happened a lot too. Kind of makes sense, right? It's a heck of a lot less destructive and risky than being like, well, we're going to fight a battle to the death, right? So again, a lot of them would have been resolved. A lot of them would have just led to larger communities growing together. However, some conflicts couldn't be resolved. So think about this too. Think about if one of your farming villages, you have an aggrandizer who's the leader. You have someone who's gotten into a position of power who is a self-interested egomaniac who's like, I don't want to make an alliance or I don't want to make a treaty with this other group. They need to give us their land, right? All it takes is one or two of those communities to make that decision where all of a sudden warfare breaks out. And that's exactly what happened. And there's an important concept, folks, that I want us to consider. It's the evolutionary ratchet. And so um, I'll get into sort of what that, what that means um, after we talk about the explanation here. So um, like I said, all it takes is one community that grows to a large size, bumps up against another community. And that community has a, has a, a leader that's like, oh, no, I'm taking, we're taking you over. And if the other community is like, no, we don't want to be a part of your community, boom, there's a war, right? However, all it takes is one instance of this. 
And then all of the communities surrounding, they need to be prepared for war because once one early state becomes warlike, what are you going to do? Either you're going to get conquered by them and enslaved, you know, or you've got to fight back. You've got to defend yourself. So what starts to happen is that um, the outbreak of war starts having a ripple effect in societies all around. And again, all it takes is one society to realize that, hey, war is profitable, right? So it makes more sense for us to get good at training warriors, people who can kill other people, than you know, having a bunch of farmers and craftspeople. Screw that. We can just take other people's stuff, right? And so all it takes, again, is for one society to do that. And then all of the other surrounding communities either have to defend themselves or they get conquered, right? That's sort of what happens. So this is what we call an evolutionary ratchet. It means that some changes, some evolutionary changes, um, they're so profound and they're so powerful in their effects that it's hard to go back from them. And a ratchet, folks, if anyone's used a ratchet, right, you know, you, you'll put it on a nut and you can turn it one way, but you can't turn it the other way, right? And that's what makes it so useful. A ratchet will drive something in one direction, either if you're going to tighten something or if you're going to loosen it, you change the setting on the ratchet to loosen it. So you, it'll turn one way, but not the other way. And this is what we, we say about some things in human history. They act as an evolutionary ratchet. They move things in a certain direction and it's hard to go back from them, right? Because like I said before, you got to think about it. As long as you've got one society in your area that is all about like creating weapons and training warriors and going out and trying to like, you know, kill people and take their stuff, what are you going to do? It forces you, even if you're a peaceful community, be like, well, we need to build walls around our, our cities too. We need to train our own warriors. We need to start transitioning our own society to reflect that, um, that change that warfare leads to. It pushes evolution in a certain direction. And so, um, and it also leads to like, it, it leads to more complexity because think about this folks. We talked about power too, a few slides before. Remember that's where societies decide, hey, there's a specialized job. You do this specialized job, right? So you don't have to go out and hunt and gather or grow food like everyone else. You know, craftspeople were, were people you give power to too as well, right? Um, priests, you know, and, and priestesses uh, are people you give power to as well. Um, warriors become another group of people as well in a society where you realize, well, we're going to need people trained to fight. We're going to need people that are not out in the fields growing food. Instead, we need an army, which means there's a whole other level of complexity that is introduced in your society. You need more food production. You need um, a system of training your soldiers. You need a military command structure. Complexity starts increasing as war becomes a bigger part of human communities. And so that's another important feature of kind of what starts happening to our societies. You know, as populations grow, as you need more specialized um, forms of people in your society, um, your decision-making systems become more sophisticated. And also, the larger your society gets, the more they become multicultural. You could have different languages being spoken all of a sudden. You could have different traditions, right? So in order to keep all that together, you need a central system of law, a central system of communication, right? So I think you can start to see that as you grow bigger, things get more complicated, right? You can't just rely on simplistic um, you know, gather around the campfire and the elder will help you like solve your problems kind of thing. It's just simply not going to work anymore. And as well, agriculture to support these societies gets very, very complex and very labor intensive. You have really complex irrigation systems that are built, you know, to sustain 
you know, populations in the tens or even hundreds of thousands. And remember, this is all before. There's no tractors, right? I mean, you may have some animals uh, pulling plows, but that's it. Apart from that, it's like muscle power that's uh, providing all of the food, that's building all of the buildings, right? So again, you need a large workforce. You need all of these things, right? Many workers, coordinated strategies. You also need to support and feed all these people, which means you've got to be storing food. And as you store food, um, all of a sudden it's like, well, who controls that food, right? Because who controls the food has a lot of power, right? They literally start to have the power of life and death. You know, because again, there's all of these non-food producing people that you have to support. Priests, politicians, warriors, merchants, people trading with other communities, right? scribes these are the people um, you know usually working for the the central government recording economic transactions crafts people you know people making your wagon wheels and carving your tools and making you know whatever else you need all of these people are not out growing food so they need food so there needs to be a storage uh, capacity um, to feed all these people and again like i said who controls the, uh, the food? Well, that gives you a lot of power, right? So what starts happening with increased complexity is increased hierarchy, right? You start getting levels of power and of decision-making. So you start moving, first of all, from a direct democracy to a representative democracy. So our early societies were direct democracies. That literally meant, like I said, that if you're if your group needed to make a decision and maybe you got a hundred people in your little sort of tribal band, uh, you know, all the adults are going to get together around the campfire and the leader is going to help them decide what they're going to do, right? Directly democratic. That means we, we all participate in decisions. When society gets too big, it becomes harder and harder to do that, right? When you got 10,000 adults in your society, it's hard to get 10,000 people together to make direct democratic decisions. Instead, what we start doing is we elect representatives and then the representatives make decisions on our behalf. So it, it, if you think about it, it's a, it's a very rational and logical way to try and maintain democracy, but also deal with complexity. You know, and so folks, what we live in today in Canada is a representative democracy. We know we're not, at Parliament Hill, like making decisions with Justin Trudeau and Jagmeet Singh and um, Aaron O'Toole and whatnot, like we're not there. We elect a representative, they go there and they're supposed to do things that we want them to do. But I'm sure we can all appreciate that it's not as democratic <laughs> as if we were actually right there and as if we were having our direct voice heard. So things start to become less directly democratic. And then in a lot of societies, that representative democracy then moves over and becomes fully oligarchy, where basically, you know, the people who are making decisions start being like, well, we don't really need to listen to the people at all. We're the ones that have the power. We're just going to sort of make decisions in our own interests. And we see this process play out. This is what's so fascinating about history, folks. You can literally see these transitions occurring. And so in the very earliest state level society that we're aware of, ancient Samaria, you start to see these early city states. So you had, you know, a city state like Uruk, right, for instance, or Ur. Um, and it was literally, a, it was a big city, right? And it would have a wall around it. There's a big central temple complex. And each of the cities had a big central square, right? And so at first, even though you might have had like, you know, 5, 10, 15,000 people in that city state, they really would all try and get together and talk things through, right, and make decisions collectively. They would elect leaders. So their leader, they called them NC. And so, you know, the, the adults would elect the leader and the leader had a certain term of office. And if you didn't like what the NC was doing, you could pull them from power. So it's really interesting. Even state level society started out 
we tried to make them as democratic as possible, right? So I think this is this is part of the story that's hopeful is that human beings, we didn't trade away democracy lightly. We wanted to maintain as much of it as we could. But what we start to see folks is like a strained ability to do that. Whereas the complexity gets too big, our ability to keep it democratic, it just stretches to the point where it breaks, right? And we see this in ancient Samaria. So when all of a sudden you have a number of city states all along the Tigris and Euphrates River, uh, you have, you know, uh, Lagash and Kish and Uruk and Ur and all these different city states, and you start to see conflict between them and warfare break out, you start to see the political decision making change. All of a sudden, the NC is no longer elected. They become a dictator and a war leader, right? And society starts becoming more oligarchic, less democratic, right? And so that's what starts happening in the earliest states. And you really see this in all of the early states. Um, it's the same pattern, right? And so this list here is uh, all the times throughout human history that a state has emerged in a certain part of the world, emerged on its own. So that means it hasn't emerged by being influenced by another state around it. So that's why they're known as pristine states. If something's pristine, it's like untouched, right? And so a pristine state is a state that just emerged organically in that area. So in Mesopotamia, about 6,000 years ago, you have the Sumerian states. 5,500 years ago in Egypt, you have the um, ancient Egyptian state in the Egyptian empire. China, 4,000 years ago. India, 2,400 years ago. Mesoamerica, uh, 2,300 years ago. Peru, Tonga, Ghana. So all these different parts of the world, right? Asia, Middle East, Africa, um, and in the New World, you see these new states emerge. And like I said before, these states have three levels of government. They tend to have a large land area. Um, so they really are like a bunch of smaller communities that get gobbled up into this bigger um, community. And of course, we know we all live in we all live in states today, so we know what those are like. We have different regions, different language groups, different, like, I mean, that's just, that's just what states are like. Um, and you also start to see a lot of social stratification that emerges. So as the states get bigger, as the political system gets more complicated, you get the different levels, you get the emperor, you get the provincial um, um, decision makers, you know, and then you get the local leadership. Uh, you start to see more and more social stratification, more inequality. And so these early states become really fully oligarchic. They're ruled by kings or queens. Um, these kings or queens have what we call legitimating ideology. And I, this is what I, I, I was referring to when I talked about King Louis in that painting before. The kings and queens are like, it's like the Egyptian pharaohs. They're like the representative of Ra on earth, Ra the sun god, right? That's what the pharaoh is, right? So what, you're going to go against the pharaoh, you're going against the sun god, right? So they have these legitimating ideologies. Legitimating means they legitimate the power of the ruler right? Uh, it's a way to convince people to do what the ruler says, right? Um, these societies start to become divided into aristocratic and common classes. So you start to see the emergence of a nobility, right? Um, you know, dukes and earls and, um, you know, whatever else, or Ottmans or Hetmans, or it depends what society you're in, right? Muftis, you know, you, you have different names for nobles in different state level societies you start to see widespread slavery. And this comes from warfare and expansion and conquest, right? So, you know, slavery was an invention of social stratification, was an invention of oligarchy before it was simply not a thing. Human beings never enslaved each other up until literally about 6,000 years ago, right? Um, you start to see things like taxation, like a central ruler able to sort of extract wealth from every single person in their territory. And um, at first it was just food, right, that they would extract. You know, you had to give a certain amount of grain or a certain amount of 
uh, herd animals or, you know, whatever, or, or it could be a uh, cloth that you'd have to spin and give to the ruler, right? You start to see imperialism. So these states expand, they conquer other territories, right? And so this is really where we then move into just what we're familiar with today in terms of our, our monarchies, medieval Europe, you know, um, the, the time of, uh, you know, the Persian Empire of, of, of ancient Greece, of ancient Rome, the Roman Empire, all the stuff that we're familiar with historically, right? The world starts to become filled with these big states all in competition with each other. And so power obviously is changing, right? We're a far, far away now uh, away from, from, you know, gathering around the fire and making collective cooperative decisions. Now we are in fully oligarchic societies, right? And so now we're into forms of power that we're more familiar with in terms of analyzing our present day societies, right? This is where, you know, the writing of folks like Karl Marx becomes really important because we're talking about differences now between social classes, right? So as societies become more complex, as, as, as decision makers are given power too, they're able to use it for their own gain, right? However, because the origins of that power were still based in the community, um, early leaders still had to use more persuasion, right? in order to get people to do what they wanted to do. Um, they couldn't fully just force people to do what they wanted to do. And so th the reason why I have uh, Marx in here is because there's an interesting concept that Marx has called false consciousness. And false consciousness is the idea that in oligarchic societies and in highly stratified societies where there's a small group of people that runs the show basically and a whole bunch of people underneath that don't have much power. Marx said that actually a lot of those people have what he calls false consciousness. And that basically means that they think that the ruler really has the people's best interests at heart, right? And that's what rulers always try and do. They always want the people to think that, oh, I'm doing this all for you, you know? I, I have, oh, this horrible burden of all this amazing power and, and this golden palace I have to live in. Oh, it's so hard. I do it all for you, people, right? And this is basically what kings and queens and have tried to do forever. Oh, and also I'm divinely appointed by God as well. God wants me to have all these goodies and riches and and palaces and castles and such a horrible thing, right? So, and of course, Marx very cynically was like, yeah, no, <laughs> like a lot of these rulers, they don't care about the people that they're, they're lording over, but they really try and convince the people that they're ruling in their best interests. And so, you know, power starts that way where it's like the kings, the queens, the chiefs, the leaders, you, you're really working hard to convince the regular people that you've got their, you got their back, you got their best interests, right? Um, and they often use deceit and trickery too. That's another really important thing that starts um, coming into power. You start to see secrecy. You start to see this whole idea of like, oh, they'll tell you one thing, but really they're making these decisions behind closed doors, these sort of sneaky political decisions. And think about it, folks, this is impossible in a small scale society. Like you just can't, if you're a leader, you got nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. Everybody knows you, everybody know, like you can't, there's no secrets, there's no conspiracies, it's literally impossible. But when your society gets big enough, when there's that disconnect between the decision makers and the people, there's tons of room for secret deals, for, deceit for we'll tell the people one thing and we'll really do this right all of this stuff starts to become regular political practice and this is where we see when when state societies emerge this earlier form of kind of trickery persuasion becomes married with also the ability to use brute force so rulers really then have a full range of options and this is where we'd say the form of power in oligarchic societies becomes hegemonic. And hegemonic is it's a certain kind of power. 
And uh, the theory comes from uh, Antonio Gramsci. He was a really important uh, figure uh, writing in the, uh, the early, like, you know, 1920s, 1930s in Italy. And, and he, was, he was a Marxist. And he studied the system of power. Um, and at the time, Italy had a capitalist government, but it, later they had a fascist coup in Italy. So this is when Benito Mussolini took power in Italy in the, uh, the 1930s. And then later Mussolini led Italy into World War II um, as an ally of Adolf Hitler and the fascist regime in Germany. And so when this all happened, Gramsci was this, you know, he's an Italian Marxist intellectual. He's obviously no fan of, of the capitalist elite. He's no fan of Mussolini and the fascists. So he gets thrown in jail and ends up being in jail for like 14 years, basically dies in prison. But while he's in there, he's thinking a lot about power and how it works in modern states. And he sort of said, well, power is a little more complicated. He's like the rulers try and rule through what he calls providing moral and intellectual leadership. So this goes back to the old school strategy that I've been talking about throughout this lecture of the rulers trying to convince the regular people that the rulers are the, the, the noblest, best, brightest people that have the best ideas for society. They have people's best interests at heart. Um, and the whole idea is that oligarchs try and convince regular people that they share the same interests. However, in states, oligarchs also have the ability to use force. So Gramsci, when he talks about hegemony, the kind of power that we have in a society, like, like literally like Canada today, there's both. There's coercion in the sense that the government can force you to do things, right? For instance, if you break a law, the police are going to show up at your door, they're going to arrest you, they're going to throw you in jail, you're going to go to court, you're going to get sentenced, you're going to like, you get fines, all of these things. That's coercion. So rulers have the ability to force people to do things. But there's also consent. So the idea is that in our societies, rulers still try as much as possible to get us to simply be like, Okay, I get it. You know, we have these laws, they're supposedly for our own good. So, you know, people don't rise up and rebel and whatnot. So in hegemonic societies, rulers are constantly focused on this idea of maintaining the illusion of value consensus. And that basically means that, oh, the leaders are, they're, they're like us, they share our dreams and our ambitions. They want what's best for the regular people. So in a society, in, a, in an oligarchic society, it's in the ruler's interest that the majority of people, if possible, feel that the ruler is legitimate, right? This is where those legitimating ideologies come in that we talked about before. You know, one of the legitimating ideologies is hereditary. Oh, I come from the royal family. The royal family is special. It's kind of interesting if you think about it, folks, like, so think about Britain today, right? They still have the royal family, you know? Um, they're just a family. Like, there's, there's literally nothing special about those people. Genetically, nothing. And in fact, genetically, they're a bit of a train wreck because a lot of royal families tend to have a lot of inbreeding that happens. So they're not even a great genetic representation of, of, of a family. I hate to say that. But beyond that, there is, there's zero that is special about them. But there's this culture, there's this mythology of like, oh, they're the royal family. They trace their bloodline back to other inbred oligarchs. Like, who cares? But the culture makes us think like we should care and that there's, there's something to it, right? Um, religion, too, is another big example as well. You know, um, there often is, and in a lot of cultures, you know, there really is. For instance, in Iran right now, I mean, part of the ruling um, uh, group are the Ayatollahs, right? Where does their power come from? Well, it's, it's completely religious, right? Um, you know, so we see this in, in, in other societies around the world, too. Um, there's, a, there's a really interesting example of the, the beginnings of this kind of legitimating ideology in, in this thing called the Code of Hammurabi. And Hammurabi was a Babylonian king. 
So the Babylonian Empire was emerged in Mesopotamia after the Sumerian Empire had kind of collapsed. And uh, Hammurabi uh, is famous because he had one of the first law codes that was written down sort of thing. But the introduction to the Code of Hammurabi is fascinating because it's this like page of I, Hammurabi, most awesome king, greatest dude to ever have lived, beloved of all the gods, builder of this pyramid and that pyramid. And he goes on and on and on and on for a page before it even gets to the laws, right? And it's a great example of, of the lengths to which kings and queens would go to try and convince all of the people that they ruled over that there are these awesome, godly, uh, you know, pure, um, untouchable kinds of beings, right? Of course, it's all complete. There's zero scientific evidence. On a certain level, folks, we could objectively say it's all BS. It's only if you can convince someone to believe it <laughs> that then it's really effective, right? Then everyone's like, oh, Hammurabi's this great, you know, divinely appointed ruler. Good for you, Hammurabi. You pulled, up, you pulled the secret maneuver. You were able to convince all the people that you're more than just, you know, another, another human being, right? However, like I said, in states, if, if that legitimating ideology ever failed, if that value consensus ever broke down, if people ever started being like, I don't know, I think the ruler is a bit of a jerk. I think he doesn't have our interests at heart. Then oligarchic states had backup. They, they could use just brute force power. So they had legitimating ideologies. That's kind of like soft power. But then they also had authoritarian strategies that they could use to maintain control. They had laws. Kings and queens had the power of life and death over their subjects. They literally could just like execute someone they didn't like, right? Uh, or you know, they'd call it for treason or whatever, right? Uh, there was, you could be enslaved, right? They had court systems, they had surveillance systems, you, you know, they had spies, jails, police forces. They'd use torture, the, you know, tax collectors. They have armies, they have all of these forces to force people to fall in line to do what the kings and the queens and the rulers wanted them to do. And so this is where we really see, you know, the height of oligarchic societies in human history is when we have all of these monarchies, these massive states ruled by, you know, kings and queens and emperors and sultans and you name it, right, all around the world. And in each oligarchic society, you have an oligarchic class. So you have this class of people, this small group in which political and economic wealth are concentrated. So if you remember back from our discussions of oligarchy. Um, in many societies, this oligarchic class is actually heterarchic. And that means that involves different social groups. So for instance, in the European Middle Ages, you had kind of three different components of that oligarchic class. You had the nobles, the aristocracy, the military, so you know all the knights and the, the military leaders, and you also had the church was very powerful too. So those three groups together formed the oligarchic class, the ruling class that then everybody else was underneath. And of course, back in the Middle Ages, most people were just peasants, right? They were just literally farming and trying to make a living, trying to survive. This is a great um, picture here from, it was put up by the industrial workers of the world. Um, and uh, yeah, and there you go, 1911. So this is a good old timey drawing. And it's basically, it's, it's, it says the pyramid of the capitalist system. So this is an interpretation anyway of how the political structure works in capitalism. And so at the very, very top of the society, you have a big bag of money, right? So they're basically saying at the end of the day, what rules um, or what determines uh, what happens in our society is simply money. It's all about money. And then up here, it says, we rule you. And here you have what? You have a king there. So you have a traditional monarch. You have, you know, a businessman here, probably a capitalist, probably a big factory owner, right? You have another politician or a diplomat there. We rule you. And then it has another layer and it says, we fool you. And who is here? 
a whole bunch of religious leaders, right? So, wow, what a cynical view of religion, because uh, they're basically like, yeah, you pretty much exist to basically pull the wool over our eyes, right? And basically convince us that, you know, um, the leaders are divinely appointed, that it's our lot in life to be poor, and that the best thing to do is to be very holy and pious and go to church every Sunday and pray for forgiveness, right? That that's what you should do, as opposed to trying to overthrow these clowns right so anyway they, they're saying like okay that you know the church it's another level of control basically then they have a level that says we shoot at you and here you have the army you have the police you know and basically this is the 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 armed might of the ruling class right so that if you get out of line um they send in the troops right and this was this was the case in the middle ages right in the middle ages in europe you know the in 900s 1100s 1300s you name it all through that period there was constant peasant rebellion right this is kind of thing that they, you know we don't often when we look at histories of those those eras we don't often encounter that constant peasant rebellions just like in the ancient Roman Empire, there was a massive slave revolt that almost toppled the whole empire led by Spartacus, right? People might be familiar with that name. So folks, throughout history, all of those people, the sort of working class or the peasant class or whatever, have always tried to rise up against these structures, right? Same thing in medieval Europe. All the time peasants were revolting. And what would the lords do then? they'd send the knights in, right, to trample the peasants underfoot. And that's basically how they maintain power. And it shows you that, you know, they certainly try to fool the lower classes all the time. And sometimes it works, but a lot of times it doesn't too. So people aren't completely stupid and gullible, right? A lot of times someone knows when they're being exploited and they rise up and they, and they try and stop it. So that's when, you know, uh, the ruling class needs, they need this too every once in a while. They need a fist to come down and squish people. Then you have a nice banquet here, and this says, we eat for you. And so they they would be considering this, they're kind of like the well-to-do, you know, that sort of 10% of the upper class that are that are doing fine. They're, they're, they're going to fancy banquets on the weekend and, and this system works for them. And at the very bottom, you have a whole bunch of people that are struggling to hold this structure up. And it says, we work for all, we feed all, right? So it's, it's just an interesting, now clearly there's an ideology behind this picture, right? Clearly this is a politically motivated view of how the system works. Clearly the people that made this picture aren't too cool with the way the structure uh, works. But it's like, it's a very interesting representation of a class system um, in, a, in a capitalist society. But of course, this picture is over a hundred years old, right? So we might say, if we, if we take this historical information, we apply it to our present day society. What do things look like today? Well, if we were to look at a modern oligarchic society, so I'm just gonna choose the example of the United States. We could also use Canada, but I'll, I'll use the States. What is the oligarchic class today in the United States? Well, first of all, it's corporate leaders. So it's, you know, people like um, Elon Musk, it's uh, big retail um, like uh, Jeff Bezos and Amazon. It's the Walton family that owns Walmart, right? It's big pharma and also the health insurance industries. So the corporate CEOs from all of these different uh, sectors of the economy finance the big Wall Street banks, the big fossil fuel companies like the you know, Coke Industries, the Coke brothers, all of these corporate leaders are part of that oligarchic class in the United States. They make decisions for everyone. Um, also, you have political leaders, and really from both the Democrats and the Republicans, right? So both parties, you have oligarchic politicians, basically politicians who are making decisions on behalf of corporate interests. You also do have some politicians that are not supporting corporate interests. For instance, for instance in, the, in the U.S. Democrats, you have people like Bernie Sanders, right, or Ilan Omar or AOC or whatnot, who have different um, allegiances. But most of the Democratic and Republican politicians, they're part of that oligarchic class. 
And you also have the military, which is very, very powerful in the United States too. And this includes big military contracting companies, uh, the top generals, all the consultants and whatnot at the Pentagon. So the military has a, a big, big role to play as well. And so this is, if we were gonna analyze the United States today, we'd say, well, that's the oligarchic class right there. So these various elite groups, they, they intersect. So they work together, they collaborate all the time. So, you know, um, the big uh, tech companies and pharma companies and fossil fuel companies will say to the politicians, these are the laws we want passed. The politicians will be like, well, I don't know, I need to get elected, give me some money. Corporations will be like, okay, here's a couple hundred grand to get elected. Politicians will be like, okay, cool. We'll pass those laws for you. Just like we saw with the revolving door, right? So they work together. Um, but also the oligarchic class also always competes for power too. So that's one of the interesting things about them. They, they cooperate, but usually they, they cooperate more when they're trying to crush the lower classes. Apart from that, they tend to also compete for power. It's just, it's just part of how that class rules, right? So at this point, I think one of, the, uh, one of the important things to point out is that there's different ways of thinking about this whole structure, the oligarchic class. And this is where we need to make a distinction between conspiracy theories versus what I'm presenting and what I call an institutional analysis, right? So folks today, and, and it's more than I've seen in a lot of years, there are a heck of a lot of conspiracy theories out there about our societies, about this oligarchic society that I've been describing. You know, there's old school theories about how you can trace all the power today back to like, you know, the, the, the Knights Templar or the Masons, you know, there's crazy theories about the lizard people, right? So this picture here is, um, you know, uh, from that conspiracy that all of the leaders, the political leaders and, and the monarchs in the world are secretly this ancient race of lizard people from the center of the earth that are trying to take over. And, and you know, I, I wish this wasn't a real thing, but it is a real thing. Um, there's a guy named David Icke, who's a, a very famous sort of conspiracy theorist, wildly popular in Britain, the country he's from. He writes about the lizard people conspiracy. There's, of course, this idea that there's this global Jewish conspiracy. And most recently, there was a, a U.S. politician, Marjorie Taylor Greene. It's quite incredible. And she was, she was talking about Jewish space lasers that were threatening the, the, the planet. Like, you can't make this stuff up. It's ridiculous. And all of these things, um, and then of course the Illuminati, this idea that there's this secret group of string pullers um, that uh, control the global economy and whatnot. So all of these are completely fanciful, fanciful, debunked, disproven theories about why the world functions the way it does, right? Um, and, you know, a lot of it is really summed up uh, today, especially in North America, through the whole sort of QAnon phenomena, right, which really plays on all of these discredited conspiracy theories. Um, and what I'm sort of arguing in my book, and obviously in this course, is that that's simply not how the world works. It, 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 the nature of oligarchy is not conspiratorial. It's not, there's no lizard people. There's not some secret group that meets, you know, at the center of the earth and, and pulls all the strings of all the governments or whatnot. It's not how it works. It's actually pretty obvious how it works. You have these oligarchic classes, you have these financial interests, these corporate interests, and um, they control the institutions of our society. So it's, it's an institutional analysis, not a conspiratorial analysis. Evidence for this too, folks, is that you see powerful groups rise and fall all the time throughout history. So there's you know, this idea that there's some unbroken, a lot of these um, conspiracy theories will say that there's this unbroken um, uh, chain of power that goes back thousands of years. It's, it's simply not true. I mean, I'll give you one example, folks. Um, I talked in um, a previous class, I know about the, uh, the global slave trade, right? Or the transatlantic slave trade. I'm gonna talk more about that in the next uh, couple of lectures too. 
But at one point, this was the largest economy on the planet. So in like, you know, late 1700s, early 1800s, uh, you, if you wanted to make a bundle of cash, um, you, were, you were in the slave trade and that's what you were doing. And vast fortunes were built um, based on, on slavery. Um, political careers were built. All of the nobles were slave owners, all the leading politicians all across Europe. And due to a really incredible movement against that practice, that completely monstrous practice, that whole economy collapsed. And all of those people who were riding high on that slave earning income, they, they, they vanished, right? I mean, some of that money was transferred to other places for sure, but a lot of fortunes were lost and a lot of politicians' uh, careers were ended and whatnot. So you see that over time, folks, power people in power go up and down, right? So there's no sort of un unbroken tradition of, of power, um, you know, which, which a lot of these conspiracy theories try and say. Um, however, what you do see is this pattern of oligarchy repeating throughout history. It's different players, it's different industries that rise to the top, but you do see this recurring pattern of a small group of people that's able to exert power and control over a much larger group of people. And of course, when you think back to the lecture on oligarchy, we covered all the ways in which this is not a great way to make decisions, right? At the end of the day, that's really kind of what it's all about. If you're interested in preserving your environment, if you're interested in averting warfare, I mean, look what's happening in Ukraine right now. It's a classic example of competing oligarchies once more leading to death and destruction and innocent people getting killed. If you don't want those things to happen, oligarchy is not the system um, uh, of decision making that you need. So this is why in uh, the book that I wrote, I, I don't pull any punches. I call oligarchy a death system. And it's because you start to see the same pattern play out over and over again in oligarchic societies. First of all, you see inequality tends to just increase, 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 increase over time. You also start to see power increase in the oligarchic class. So you start to see less and less democracy over time. The entire society starts to become captive to what I call the oligarchic imperative. And all that really is, is just the narrow political and economic interests of the oligarchic class. So again, you don't need lizard people. You don't need any sort of weird theory. All you need are human beings who are selfish and they're disconnected from the other human beings in their society, right? They become insulated in terms of how they see themselves. Uh, they start kind of believing the hype, right? That they are the chosen ones, they are the deciders, they are the rulers, they are the leaders. And as soon as that happens, I mean, just, you know, things follow the same pattern over and over again, unfortunately. It leads to violence, social upheaval. It leads to the oppression of people trying to rise up for equality. It leads to war and it leads to environmental destruction. Hence my calling it a death system. That's kind of what it leads to. Oligarchic societies end up collapsing. And really that's the whole point of this course is what makes societies collapse, right? And how can we prevent that? It seems if you study history that every single time you have an oligarchic society that this is what tends to happen, that it tends to, these contradictions build up within it and then it collapses. And there's two um, aspects of this kind of core dysfunction of oligarchy. Uh, that we need to focus on. <clears throat> so the oligarchic imperative involves two aspects, political domination and economic exploitation. So this basically means the people in, in control, right? So remember, if we think about the United States we, um, today, who are we talking about? Executives of massive corporations, political elites, and the military industrial complex. These interests, again, no conspiracies, don't need any of that. They're just people who are making a lot of money doing, doing what they're doing. They wanna keep making money. They wanna keep in positions of power and influence. And so because of that, they 
are focused on two things. One is political domination. That means controlling the decision-making process, ensuring that they stay in power. This is where all those strategies like the revolving door and whatnot and campaign finance that we talked about um, in the section on oligarchy come in. You know, it's pretty simple. If you are a politician and you like your life and you like all the money you get um, from corporations, then you pass laws in the interest of those corporations, right? Um, if you're a corporation, you don't want those laws to change. So for instance, if you're Monsanto, one of the world's largest chemical companies, and you don't want governments banning neonicotinoid, um, oh, what am I trying to say here? Pesticides. Those are the pesticides that are killing bees all over the world. And of course, if you're Monsanto, you're like, you don't want those banned because you're making tons of money selling those. So what are you going to do? You're going to give money to the people who are making those decisions in the political system. It's pretty, it's pretty basic. It's just business, right? So that's where political domination comes in. You want to control the political system. And you also, if people rise up and want to fight against it, you want to tamp them down. You want to make free speech illegal. You want to make protest something that can get you arrested, right? Um, you want strong libel laws, right? All these sorts of things. Again, that's to control decision-making, right? So that's one thing you see in oligarchic societies. On the other hand, you see an intensified desire for economic exploitation. That means, you know, you want to keep extracting as much wealth as you can out of the society. That's why oligarchs always fight. They fight against unionization. They fight against minimum wages. They fight against better labor laws. They fight against all of those things. They fight against any increases to their taxes that they would pay, right? They fight for tax breaks over and over again. It's a very simple equation. They're trying to make more money, right? But when you look at these two things, this drive for political domination, this drive for economic exploitation, you start to see some really corrosive effects on the overall society, right? Um, and they start really decaying the society's actual ability to function and to sustain itself. And so there's two contradictions which start emerging within oligarchic societies two contradictions that lead to collapse. One is a social contradiction. So you have a situation where in an oligarchic society, the oligarchic class tries to intensify exploitation. So that's all those things I just mentioned, folks. They're gonna try and keep wages low. They're gonna try and ensure that it's hard for you to join a union. They're gonna try and keep their taxes low, right? And if their taxes are low, there's not gonna be government funding for healthcare or for education. So all of this exploitation that is being felt by all the lower classes, this starts to weaken the value consensus, right? So we gotta think about the whole idea that member in our society, part of how the leaders maintain control is by having enough people believe that, well, you know, at the end of the day, politicians kind of are, you know, they have our interests at heart or the big business leaders or whatnot. But if you really are exploiting people and you're screwing them over, eventually they're like, okay, this is not okay. Like our, our, our rulers are illegitimate. Big business leaders are crooks, right? The value consensus starts weakening. And as the value consensus weakens, as people start waking up to their own exploitation, people start getting pissed off. We start pushing back. We start rebelling. There's protests. There's, you know, there's various ways in which people start saying enough is enough, right? And in response to that rebellion from the general populace, what the oligarchic class tends to do is they want to expand their capacity for domination. What does that look like? Well, it looks like, for instance, you've seen this in Canada and the United States over the past, like, you know, uh, 15, 20 years is the militarization of local police forces. You know, every uh, force now has uh, SWAT teams and tactical teams. A lot of police forces have uh, military equipment now, like armored personnel carriers, right? You start to see an intensification and evolution in crowd control techniques, right? 
Um, you start to see, you know, all these, all this new stuff. They have the sound wave cannons and the microwave cannons and the water cannons and the tear gas and the pepper spray. Like you start to see states double down on the ability to control their population. And so this leads to intensifying exploitation, which further weakens the value consensus. And this becomes, folks, a positive feedback loop that the more people say like this sucks and they try and rise up, the more the oligarchic class tries to push down, which pisses the people off even more. And really this is the kind of stuff that leads to eventually like revolutions, civil wars, government collapses, you name it. When it reaches a point where people are so desperate and so pissed off and so disillusioned that they just don't care anymore and they'll do whatever it takes to try and change the situation. So this social contradiction tends to intensify in oligarchic societies. And it leads to a real crisis, right? A crisis in legitimacy of the oligarchy. Um, but there's another contradiction that plays out as well. And this is more of an ecological contradiction because all of this activity isn't just, it doesn't just exact the human cost in the sense of how our economies function, how our political systems function, how happy people are, you know, how complacent, but it also starts impacting the, the environment itself. So part of wanting to make more and more money as an oligarch, as a large corporation, means the intensifying exploitation of ecosystem resources. So you're not just intensifying, intensifying the exploitation of human beings, but also of the natural world. What does this look like? Well, more and more water gets used for industrial processes. More and more oil gets used for industrial processes. More and more waste is uh, produced that goes to landfills, right? Um, you know, more and more agricultural land is used up or, um, you know, in a lot of cases for development, right? So all of these economic processes, as they're ramped up, you're basically, uh, the environment is taking a, a beating, right? Uh, all these resources are getting depleted. And this critical depletion of ecosystem resources then starts to have its own effects, right? You start getting economic, social, and political crises. Why? Because people are having a hard time getting the basics of what they need. Now, this is, a, this is a cycle we haven't seen quite so much in a country like Canada, but in other parts of the world, this is a huge deal where there is not enough good land to grow food anymore. There's not enough clean water anymore, right? You see this, I know um, uh, in India, there's a lot of um, issues with drought in certain part of the countries and with aquifers being depleted. But you also have in that same country, you have massive bottling plants for huge soft drink companies like for Coca-Cola and Pepsi and whatnot. And they're taking all this fresh water and they're bottling it uh, to create carbonated beverages to sell all over the world. Whereas you have populations right there in India that are not able to get enough clean water to survive. It's a classic example of that contradiction between corporate profit and people's livelihood and sustainability. And that starts leading to more and more, again, crisis and upheaval. You know, climate change is another example of this too, right? Because as the industrial economy moves forward, as more emissions are released, um, you're getting wildfires in British Columbia and California. You know, you're getting really, really serious issues, flooding, mudslides, you name it. And again, this all leads to instability, right? So what this tends to lead to, or especially historically, it's tended to lead to societies to want to expand more, right? So either through warfare or territorial expansion. In the modern era, it's been less war, although that's part of it, but territorial expansion can also be in terms of taking control of the economies of other countries, right? Something the United States is very, very good at. But of course, the US will also simply just invade like they did in Iraq. If they're like, yeah, we want your oil, they'll just go in and just take it, right? Or um, if they want access to, you know, natural gas or minerals or whatnot in Afghanistan, they'll also just, you know, they'll, they'll just invade and they'll, they'll just take over too. So this ecological contradiction, also what it does 
is it starts turning up the heat. It starts ratcheting up the level of crisis within a society, right? And at the end of the day, it's almost like whether it's the social contradiction or the ecological contradiction, oligarchy starts behaving like a cancer. It grows and grows and grows to the point at which it kills the host. It collapses the society's ability to sustain itself over time. And so, again, we've talked about these things in terms of overshoot, in terms of oligarchy, in terms of tipping points in scale and complexity. But in this lecture, I guess what I've been trying to convey is that this is a cycle we see throughout thousands of years of history. Um, and it's, it's actually quite shocking how reliable it is that societies will do this. They'll grow, 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 and they'll collapse. And they'll grow, 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 and then they'll collapse, right? And we really seem to be caught in the same historical cycle of social crisis and ecological crisis leading to civilization collapse. So I think what I'll do is um, we'll end off uh, here for, uh, for the lecture today. And um, the next couple of lectures, what we're gonna do is we're finally gonna start really looking at some of the thinking and not just thinking, but the doing that has gone into um, trying to solve some of these problems about civilization collapse, trying to envision a different future, right? Um, people working on this problem of, can we solve this core issue of growing, 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 and then collapsing? Um, so I will just say that there are, um, the good news is yes, there are people that think we can break this cycle. Um, so we're going to try to, yeah, we're going to try to see how that could be done. So that'll be next week's lecture and, um, and the lecture after that. So if, if anyone else has um, any sort of questions or especially any other questions related to the assignments before we get going, just feel free to fire away. Actually, just have a question about the final exam date. Yes. I'm just wondering. I think I saw April 11th it opens, but I'm not sure if that was the the actual date. Uh, I'm pretty sure we did get the final date. Um, I, I'll double check that, but yeah, I'm I'm pretty sure that that was the uh, the final date that I had that circulated. Um, and if it is, then it'll be open for the whole day. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I think I usually do it from 11 till 11. Oh, Sarah, I'm sorry. You know what? I, you had mentioned that before. I'm going to make a note of that so I don't forget that you, you wanted to see the uh, correct answers for the midterm. Thank you for reminding me. I'll do that. Thank you. Super. Okay, folks. Well, listen, best of luck in uh, getting uh, getting the essays done in connecting with your group members. If you're unable to connect with your group members, let me know and I'll, I'll do what I can do uh, to help out too. Take care of Medina. Take care of Michelle. Take care of Peter. Good to see everyone. Have a good weekend.